In April 1938, Action Comics number no. 1 debuted, and with it, the son of Krypton himself. Superman! This straight-up, uncomplicated, easy-to-root-for guy, created by two dorky Jewish 20-somethings, hit the nerve of Depression-era America right in the center. But even when doing so, he was far from fully developed yet. It would take some time for the character to find his stride. But curiously enough, not as much time as you would think. Welcome to Sergeant Panther's Rant Views. Here's the story of Fleischer Superman. The birth of the modern superhero. Be sure to stay tuned for new videos every month, and like and subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Superman's immense popularity as both a comic and as a radio serial starting in 1940 made it clear that Superman needed to be put on the big screen. And this is where Fleischer Studios came into the picture. The achievements and innovations of Fleischer Studios and the men behind the name are too numerous to count. They took the idea of making a series of drawings and tricking you into believing there's something moving and alive there, and absolutely ran with it. It can be argued that even Walt Disney's famous Steamboat Willie, at least in the parts that they don't like to show you, which, you know, is basically everything except this, imitated that mischievous nature that dominated the cartooning scene thanks to the Fleischer Brothers' work. Their cartoons came with a certain East Coast, early 20th century, rough and tumble sensibility, best illustrated by their biggest stars. Betty Boop, and Popeye the Sailor Man. Give me that piece. Their shorts were violent, sexy, heartfelt, unabashedly funny. <laughs> Sometimes technically stunning and undoubtedly urban, all while being presented in a bouncy, roundish, very physical way that made them perfect for general audiences worldwide. So what if you took that sheer animation power and urbane nature and directed it towards something more... super. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman. This is what you get. A series of awesome adventures that pit Superman against some incredibly varied forces, all fully befitting the Man of Steel. Mad scientists, giant lizards, giant apes, thieves with super gadgets, more mad scientists, a comet, a volcano, and even this Frankensteinian ray gun called the Electrothanasia Ray that turns buildings into rubber. These original nine shorts that make up the first half of the series are as close as you can get to creating the perfect Superman. Just the right amount of power, amazingly executed premises, great sound design, great voice work by the cast of the radio show, great title cards, a thousand and one little touches that add so much personality to the animation, and brilliant cinematography, excelling at making the most of the rotoscoping used for the shorts. Take this scene from Billion Dollar Limited, for example. During the opening, they hit you with that one-two punch where there's a shadow coming over the obligatory introductory newspaper, making it not only an object in the world, but using that to then transition to all these painstakingly animated people just working. It sounds stupid, but when they revealed who was casting that shadow, I forgot I was watching a cartoon there for a second. There's just so much detail in that silhouette alone. I mean, just imagine that coming up on the big screen in the 1940s. It's great. In fact, this art style on the whole is pretty good at keeping this premise with one foot in reality. But with reality, there also come a few sore spots. And now let's talk about the second half of the shorts. And to explain that one, we must do some history. Cue the Mark Felton theme.
In the late 30s, Fleischer wasn't doing well. In response to Disney's Snow White, the first ever cell animated feature film, Fleischer was contracted to release two features of their own, Gulliver's Travels and Mr. Bug Goes to Town, both produced within a combined time frame of four years, this same time it took to get Snow White off the ground. This, alongside demand to increase overall output, an ill-advised move to Miami, financial troubles, a runaway affair with a secretary, and resulting feud between Dave and Max Fleischer, left the studio strained with both brothers being forcibly resigned not long after. And in a more cruel world, that letting go of both their producer and director would have brought about the untimely end of the Superman shorts. But that didn't really happen. What happened was stranger. The company was reorganized, got a rebrand, some of the writers of the shorts took over as directors, and the content shifted away from sci-fi to... Seemingly whatever those writers felt like at the time. From mummy adventures and spy stories, to what I can only describe as proto-Nazi exploitation. I warned you, Fräulein. Unless you talk, I will make no effort to interfere with these natives. Oh, cut the comic opera stuff. Very well, Nungala. A far cry from the man of tomorrow versus the evils of mad science, yes. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Many of these plots give us a bit of an insight into the American mindset of 1942 and 43. In fact, some seem to only reluctantly feature Superman. I made an entire video talking about each short individually, so you can check that out if you want to get more details. But bottom line is that the biggest criticism I have against these shorts, aside from that some are definitely too short and too ill-fitting for Superman, is that they are just too pretty for their own good, making it just that much more tragic whenever these resources and brilliant art direction goes towards something that is now pretty alienating. But that comes with that original Fleischer spirit of striving to be more modern, current, and mature. Even if some parts aren't ideal and could have gone farther, these shorts pushing against the limitations of this character and the medium at the time their creativity and willingness to push boundaries for commercially viable animation adds to their appeal. These shorts came at a critical point for the medium, just after Disney opened the doors to more meaningful animation and before television shook things up once again. The 1940s was a wild time of pioneers, and as the first action cartoon ever, Superman is no exception. These shorts are moving works of popular commercial art, they refined what Fleischer already had and understood what it's like to live in a big city, to look up in the sky, to be a man and look up at the big things happening around you. These are masterpieces, culmination of artistic ability and popular appeal. If you have never seen these shorts, you have missed out. A YouTube playlist of all of them is in the description. Woo! Cool! So that was my review of the Fleischer Superman shorts. I've been thinking about reviewing this whole series for a long time, so tell me how you think it came out, and drop a comment down below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for new videos every month. Check out my last video where I ranked all of these shorts and kinda gave them a little bit more spotlight. I think that one came out really good. And while you're at it, tell me about some of your favorite weird stories from comics. If I had to pick my favorite weird stories from comics, I really enjoyed those weird stories where Superman just gets a lion head for no reason, or Lois Lane transforms into a super horse. <laughs> or for more newer stuff, how about we talk about that one where they took Hanna-Barbera characters and turned it into a serious story about oppressed gay streaker furries in the 50s. <laughs> that one was really interesting and an actual thing that happened. Just like Archie vs Predator. And oh my god, that one was so amazing. But uh, anyway, I'm rambling. Um. Have a good day.